It's October 2nd, and I'm your host, Paula Hersey. On today's show, we learn about submitting grants requests for the Mid-Cape Cultural Council and meet some very lucky little Head Start turtle hatchlings on Sandy Neck. Here's some news you can use. Did you know 85% of all jobs are found through networking? If you are unemployed and actively looking, underemployed, seeking for a new career direction, re-entering the job market after a long employment gap, recently retired and looking for your encore career. This networking group program is perfect for you. The 50 plus job networking group is actually a grant funded opportunity from the Massachusetts Council on Aging to assist people that are over 50 years old and actively seeking work, whether it's part time or full time. And they're running into some unique challenges and we're here to support them. Ellen is a, a career coach with many years of experience and of course I work in the aging uh, services network. So I think we have a good perspective on what people want and what people need, and they actually let us know. So this is a free group. It's open to anyone here on Cape Cod, and if you're 50 plus, please join us the first and third uh, Monday of every month from 9 to 11. Sure, what we do is we help um, people who are 50 and over build awareness and build skills on what's next in their life. So we step back and take a look at all of their accomplishments to date, how to leverage all of those skills related to those accomplishments, and then put, a, put their brand together on how do I, I know what I want, now how do I get there? We build technical skills as well. So we work on interview skills training, we work on resume writing, and we work on networking more, more important than anything. Uh, the beauty of networking with your peers is they understand where you're coming from. Oftentimes they've been there, they've done that. And so they share not only their experiences, but they share who they know, what they've done, where they've worked, and provide introductions to new possibilities. I think anyone is a good candidate, even if you're not, you know, I shouldn't say this, but even if you're not quite 50, it's okay to be here. Um, what I, the, the pattern of people that I see coming in are people who have taken time off because, for example, they may have retired and then they're like, wait a minute, I'm not ready to retire. What do I want to do next? Or they've been laid off and through that devastating um, experience, uh, you know, sometimes their confidence is, a little, is hit a little bit. Um, or they elected to take time off to care for a loved one. That's a pretty common theme here as well. Mm -hmm. And um, how to get back into the workforce after you've taken that care of that loved one. And it's so, it, it's so possible. It just requires a little bit of thinking and a little bit of strategy, but I've seen it done and done by good people. Absolutely, I think that there is great value in peer support. As mm -hmm. Ellen said, many of these folks, this is a new experience for them, whether they lost uh, their job or their career for many of them during the economic downturn in 2008, 2009, they lost good jobs and they've been struggling to get on their feet ever since. And it's a real cross section of people from all sorts of industries and mm -hmm. backgrounds. But what is common themed is their generosity and their willingness to support each other and to share their experience as only they know best. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that for sure. I think that's all the more reason to join a group like this because people do help each other out. And I'll tell you, the first uh, year that I ran this program, I had a woman who was born and raised here, and she happened to be in human resources. Mm -hmm. And she validated exactly what you're sharing, is that if you're not born here and you're a washashore, it's going to be really hard. And it is. It, it, it truly is hard, but it's not impossible, and it's absolutely achievable, for sure, because I've seen it. I would encourage anyone that is struggling to find employment or is interested in maybe reinventing themselves. They've had one type of career. Perhaps their aspiration is to work part-time in a different sector. 
Um, come and join us. It's free. There's no obligation to attend. You can come once and just see if this is something of value to you. But I think you'll find a warm, inviting group. And I can tell you for sure that you will get a lot of valuable information from Ellen Brady that will be so useful to you. So please join us. We're here the first and third Monday every month from 9 to 11 a.m. at the Barnstable Senior Center at 825 Falmouth Road, right in Hyannis. I'm Donna Burns, I'm the Assistant Director, and my direct line is 508-862-4753. And if you'd like to know a little more, I'd be happy to talk to you. And can I just add one important element? I think, I don't know if you said it or not, my apologies, it's free of charge. Free. <laughs> <laughs> but the value is great. Absolutely. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. How are you? I'm pretty good. How about yourself? Pretty good. Well, things are going well. How are things for you? You know what? It's uh, pretty good. There's, you know, a new staff member here at Channel 18. So oh, we're, really? Yeah, we're really excited. So we're fully staffed for the first time. Wow, that is awesome. It is. So look for more stuff with the police department. <laughs> Maybe another one of those dance-offs. Oh. <laughs> I think I've hung up my dance and shoes for a little while. <laughs> we will see. Well, we know you haven't hung up your coffee cup, so uh, we hear that there's a national coffee uh, out with a cop tomorrow. Yep, uh, Dunkin' Donuts has. It's a nationwide event they do, National Coffee with a Cop Day. And um, there's locations all over the Cape. Different departments are participating. Um, we are going to be participating, and we're going to be at – the Windmill Square location of Dunkin' Donuts, for anyone that doesn't know, that is the corner of Putnam Ave and Route 28 out in Katuit, right on the Marston's Mills line there. Excellent. And we will be out there from 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. And it's just Dunkin' now. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. I, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't buy into that. Well, you know, you need the donuts, right? Yeah, you got to <laughs> eat. What's, what's coffee without a donut? <laughs> exactly. So, Chief, tell us uh, a little bit about the significance of this type of event and what it does for community engagement. Uh, well, again, it's just down to communication, getting out there and talking to people. Uh, most of the time when we deal with people, it's not exactly in the best of circumstances. People are either in crisis or it's a volatile situation, and those situations really don't tend to the best of communication on anybody's part. So um, getting out there and talking to people, in normal normal everyday circumstances can help uh, facilitate the talking and gets us out there and people can approach us with just different concerns they have or just different questions and we can talk in a more relaxed environment instead of something that's you know a crisis type situation right and last time we uh, had coffee with a cop uh, we saw some youngsters with you and and what's the significance of having children um, learning about the police officers and the police department at a very young age. Well, so they can learn that you know we're approachable people, and if they need anything, they can come to us. I mean, even still, this day, all too often, I go go different places wearing the uniform, and you know we're used more as a boogeyman than anything else. And parents will say, "Well, if you don't behave, he's going to lock you up and take you to jail." And it may seem insignificant to you, but you know, kids believe what you tell them. You know, parents, I know we have a hard time, especially parents with teenagers, you have a hard time believing that they actually listen to what you're saying, but they do. You know, they, they listen to what you're saying, they listen to you, they follow your example, and a lot of times even you don't even have to say anything, just the things you do every day uh, forms their opinions in life later on. You know, they're, they're a sponge and they're absorbing everything you do. Um, not only what you do, but what, you know, other people who they see as in positions of authority or power, you know, obviously if their parents are treating a police officer with some respect and with some authority, they will also follow along with that. And if you're, you know, dismissive or whatever, they're going to follow along with that. And in this day and age, it's even more difficult given the fact that uh, people seem to have a tendency to deal uh, their interactions with others more on an electronic basis over the internet or whatever. Even talking on the phone seems to be dying off these days. Everything's text messages and emails and Facebook and getting out there and having that interaction 
and establishing that other people are real people too is also beneficial. Right. Well, we do have some electronic things that will be happening uh, on the federal level. Um, you uh, yes, yes. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, there is going to be a federal, so it's a nationwide test of the emergency alert system and the wireless emergency alert. So it's going to be at about 2.15 in the afternoon. It's going to commence. And the message is going to say something along the line of pre presidential alert. This is just that this is a test of the national wireless emergency alert system. No action is needed. So I know some people turn their alerts off and whatever, but even still you get amber alerts and you know, weather alerts on your phone. This is something similar, but it's the first time they've really tested it nationwide through FEMA. So we don't want anybody to be um, freaked out by it, that they're getting these messages, and they're just trying to test the system to make sure everything is working just fine. You know, these kids we used to see, even now you still see them on the TV when they interrupt your TV show right. or radio program with those alerts. It's just basically the same thing. Okay, so, and that's going to happen tomorrow afternoon? Tomorrow afternoon on Coffee with a Cop Day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wednesday, October 3rd, and they're slating it for like 218. So, you know, the government might be a little early, might be a little bit late. So, okay. <laughs> um, so Coffee at, uh, with a Cop is? 7.30 a.m. 7.30 a.m., and that's in, well, we consider it Marston's Mills, but Ketua at Marston's Mills Live. The Windmill Plaza out oh, there, corner of Putnam Ave and Route 28. Excellent, at Duncan. Add du yes, Duncan and the donuts. Will there still be donuts? It's not just the Duncan. What are you Duncan when they're saying the Duncan? What are they Duncan? It's going to be donuts. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk to you soon, Chief. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Natural Resource Officer Sean Cordes took Channel 18 out to the dunes of Sandy Neck ORV Trail to find the diamondback terrapin turtle hatchlings that just made their way into this world. Sean explains the dangers of leaving these wee ones out to fend for themselves and why the Head Start program is so important to the species. It's back to school for the Diamondback Terrapins. The Head Start program is in full swing out here in Sandy Neck with me today, Natural Resource Officer Sean Cordes. Sean, we've yeah. got some babies. We do, yeah. Yep, so uh, this is always one of my favorite times of the year. Um, it's in that stage of the program where a lot of these nests that were laid in June and July are finally starting to hatch out. So we're starting to see the small diamondback terrapin hatchlings in the wild make their way out to the marsh. And then we're also getting our first hatchlings for the Head Start program that we do here in the town of Barnstable. So we're out monitoring some of those nests today um, and getting them ready for the school year. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this Head Start program and why it's necessary for yep. these um, little turtles to really mm -hmm. survive in the wild now. Yeah, so that the diamondback terrapin is a protected species in here in Massachusetts. It's listed as threatened. A um, couple of reasons for that. Historically, the diamondback terrapin was actually um, hunted for food for a period of time. Uh, turtle soup was a delicacy back in the 19th century, early 20th century, um, and then habitat loss certainly had an impact on their populations as well. Um, salt marshes, like a lot of wetlands, have been destroyed and filled in over the years. So we have these few uh, remaining populations here on Cape Cod, uh, the one in the town of Barnstable being out here in the Barnstable Great Marsh, uh, and they nest right here at Sandy Neck Beach. So because their populations are historically lower than they likely have been, um, it's that much harder for their, you know, f for them to be able to continue this process year after year. Um, terrapins generally survive by laying a lot of eggs, and a small fraction of those eggs will naturally uh, make it to adulthood. But the percentage is only about one in every 100 eggs. Um, we've faced a lot of issues here with predation on both nests and hatchlings. So this Head Start program is a, a good way to be able to combat some of that and get some of these turtles um, sort of bigger and stronger than they would be in the wild uh, before we release them back out, which should you know, bring that 
chance of survival up quite a bit. Right. So they don't follow rules of the road or anything. So a lot of these are like literally in the middle of the trail where they'll lay their eggs. What what happens when that is like, you know, you, you, vehicles are passing through this all the time. Yeah, exactly. So the um, the trails that these diamondback terrapins cross when they go from the marsh into the sand dunes where they nest um, is also made out of sand. So generally it's a hiking trail for most. There's only a few vehicles that can access these trails uh, because there are, you know, small camps and cottages out here. Um, but to a terrapin, that trail is no different than the sand dunes beyond it. And so it looks like a good nesting spot for them. So these nests that are laid in the trail would otherwise be run over if we weren't out monitoring them. Um, what we're able to do is actually find those nests and carefully extract them and relocate them to a new safer site. And we monitor those out you know, throughout the season until this time of year when they hatch out. And those are the turtles that we use for this Head Start program. And um, they will be you know, raised by schools and some other organizations throughout the season uh, you know, so that we can release them out next season. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the Head Start program mm -hmm. itself. Uh, so these turtles don't remain with you at the gatehouse. They go to schools and senior centers. And so tell us how that works. Yeah. So um, once these these nests have uh, started hatching out, which we're seeing uh, this week, we've had our first hatchlings sort of make it to that stage. Um, we take care of them here at Sandy Neck until they get to the point where their yolk sac dries up. So that's on the plastron or that sort of underside of their shell. Uh, and that actually provides them with enough energy and nutrients to in the wild be able to make it out to the marsh or to make it to a nice spot in the sand dunes to be able to burrow down um, and sort of go into a type of hibernation or, you know, throughout the winter. So these particular turtles for our Head Start program aren't doing that. They're not going out to the marsh this winter, but we still have to wait for those yolk sacs to dry up before they can start eating on their own. So once that happens, they get transferred over to our main headquarters at MEA and they're in small tanks there uh, until the point where they're able to feed on their own. And from that point, we're able to distribute them out to schools, to libraries, all of these great programs that are um, you know, part of the overall Head Start program. And they stay in those tanks throughout the winter time. And instead of in the wilds, you know, they'd be hibernating, not doing much, not growing. Um, they're in these tanks in warm water, they're eating lots of food every day and they're growing big and strong. And generally, throughout that six to eight months, they're gonna grow to be about the size of a three-year-old turtle. Um, so their shell's nice and strong and solid and they're released right back out into the marsh. So a lot of those predators that would normally go after them when they're you know, just a tiny little hatchling um, aren't gonna have that opportunity. So um, it's, it's been a really good system. We've seen it, you know, it's been pretty, pretty successful thus far. So. Right. Um, we're excited for another year of it. So tell me a little bit about what kids are learning. When, when you put a turtle in a classroom or even libraries or mm -hmm. a senior center, what do people learn from this uh, opportunity? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great program. They learn everything from just the, the anatomy of that animal, of a, of a little turtle, to the um, ecology of the whole system here at Sandy Neck. Um, so they're learning all about the resources here and the Great Marsh and the Barrier Beach. And they're also learning about um, what we can do to protect species in the world and here in our own backyard. So they are working with an endangered species um, and understanding that it's a fun process to be able to be a part of this program and watch them grow. But it's also really important for conservation efforts. Um, you know, they are having a direct impact on restoring a population right here on Cape Cod. So this is one of those nests that's part of our Head Start program. As you can see, that's a, a bucketed nest, one that we relocated right from the marsh trail just off to our um, left-hand side here. And what I'll be doing now is pulling this cap off the top and checking to see where we're at with the hatching process. So we have a couple of hatchlings right here on the top which is a good sign. So we'll be pulling this nest and bringing it back to the garage here at Sandy Neck to evaluate the rest of the hatching. But both of these individuals look nice and healthy. Um, they're a good size. And if you look at the bottom, they still have a little bit of that yolk sac, but it is starting to dry up um, pretty nicely. So we'll probably have them for a couple of days before they go back to the office and uh, start swimming around and hopefully feeding pretty soon here as well.
so we can check real quick and just see where we're at with the rest of these eggs in here. So we have a few more in here as well. And it's interesting, you always have to be very careful at this point. Um, you know, not only are the eggs delicate, but you'd be surprised at how soft the shells are on these right. hatchlings when they first come out. Um, even though they look, you know, sort of just like a miniature version of some of the adults, uh, you know, they're still quite fragile at this point in time. Which is why at this size, you know, predators can be such an issue. There's, um, you know, thing, everything from birds to raccoons and um, fox can sort of eat them whole. <laughs> We'll take the whole nest back with us. Oh, because now they're, ha they're hatching out, so they're, they've yeah. started the process. So we'll put them on a heat lamp um, as the rest of them continue oh, to incubate. One. But yeah, we gotta. <gasps> it looks like most of them have already hatched. Sometimes it takes a while for them to either emerge out. Um, and oftentimes, too, you know, one of the other things that they can do in the wild is when they hatch out, they actually stay right there in the, the nest bowl and just wait until the spring to emerge and go out really? to the marsh. Mm -hmm. Wow. And again, that's, uh, you know, an adaptation to help combat the fact that there's so many predators. So right. if every single nest hatched out and went straight to the marsh, there are chances of, uh, you know, even just a couple predators taking most of them out as high. So. My goodness. Are yep, they alive? There's at least two. Yep, they're alive. So I'll, uh, they're, uh, they're enjoying it. Oh my it. god! Yep, they are ready to go. There's okay. another one down below that. Wow! Five. You can see there's, you know, an egg in here too that's still unhatched. A couple of them. Oh my goodness! Look at that! Oh my gosh! That's so cool! Yeah, let's see if I can... There's one in here that's ready to hatch. Is it like cracked? Is yep. that yeah, so the turtle's in there. It's it's you know started to crack out of its shell and um, you know pretty soon it should be Hard. It might be hard to see on the cameras, but I can show you on these animals. On the very tip of their nose when they're first born, you can see that little point. Yeah. That sharp point, so that's an egg tooth. A lot of reptiles have this, a lot of birds have this. And that's there um, to help them actually crack through that shell of their egg to start wow. out with and, and emerge. So you, you also see that out here on, you know, like the piping plovers and the yeah. least terns. They'll have those. And it'll go away after a period of time. So these same turtles, if they're the ones that, um, for example, stayed underground in the dunes over winter and they came out, that would be gone by the springtime. Um, so you can tell that you know they were, they had hatched out in the fall yeah. and were just emerging. Oh, so. okay. So uh, cool. Yeah. One of the the things we have to be careful with um, when we do catch them at this point yep. is. Uh, there's potential that they could, if they don't uh, hatch out of the egg fast enough, they can actually dry to that egg and get stuck and it can pull the yolk um, sac oh, out. Oh, off, yeah. Um, which does happen in the wilds, but yeah. yeah, we definitely are mindful of that and careful to make sure that they get ample opportunity to not do that. Here's a look at this week's meeting schedule for boards, commissions, and committees.
questions, accolades, connect with us on Facebook or Instagram, email us, or send us an old-fashioned note by Carrier Pigeon. Channel 18 works for you. I'm Paula Hersey, and thank you for watching Barnstable today. Thank you.